Good morning. Welcome to Men of the Word. I ministry at Calvary Chapel Heartland, Peach County, Georgia, just a few miles east of Fort Valley. We're on Highway 96. My name is Greg Cannington, and for the next two weeks, I will be filling in for Pastor Jerry Axdell, as I've done for the previous two weeks, in a study of the book of Malachi, the last of the Old Testament prophets. Here at Calvary Chapel Heartland, we teach the Word of God chapter by chapter, verse by verse, both the Old and the New Testaments, because it's all important. St. Paul tells us that. And to give you an example of what we do here, our senior pastor, Pastor Steve, has just completed this Sunday a nearly year-long study through the book of Revelation and how pertinent it is in our day and time. Pastor Phil is currently taking us through a study in the book of Genesis, the beginning in uh, a ministry called The Word on Wednesday. Our youth pastor, Pastor Kurt, and his men, Misfits student ministry has just recently, a few weeks ago, completed a, a, a wonderful study in the book of Romans and has begun a study in the uh, book of Isaiah. And here at Men of the Word for the last year, a little bit more than a year, we've been going through studies of the all the minor prophets. And when you do, you discover there's nothing minor about them other than some of their links. And next week, we'll complete the study in Malachi, thus ending the study in the minor prophets and the end of the Old Testament. All of these ministries that I just spoke of are available on our Facebook page, the Calvary Chapel Facebook page, and our YouTube channel. So if you think if you've missed one or want to play catch up, by all means go in and uh, look at them, watch them. Uh, I believe that you'll get a lot out of it, and we find that uh, we hear from people that have never seen or heard some of these studies, but it's available to you, so take advantage of it. Before we begin this morning, I'd like to open this with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your blessings, Lord. We thank you for our time together, studying your word, Lord, letting it marinate in our hearts and our souls. We pray that you'll send the Holy Spirit here among us to open up our hearts and minds and let us see the deeper meanings, Lord, that you have for us. All these things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Christ. Amen. Now, if you've been with us uh, two weeks ago in our overview of Malachi, we learned that Malachi was not only the last of the minor prophets and the last in the Old Testament, but he was the last prophet to Israel or the Jews, for, four, for 400 years. They were written about uh, 433 to 424 B.C., thereabouts, roughly 100 years after the prophets Malachi and Zechariah. And Malachi's prophecy began with God declaring his love for his chosen people, but telling them in no uncertain terms they have lost sight of true worship. And Malachi's prophecies are all come out, and the word from God comes out as a, like an advocate, uh, advocating for God, asking rhetorical questions that the people would be asking while telling them how God feels. For example, in uh, chapter 1, God reminded the people of his everlasting love but he severely chastises them for bringing polluted sacrifices of blemished animals and the less than perfect gifts for sacrifice, which is a direct violation of Levitical laws laid down in Leviticus by Moses. And he ends chapter 1 telling the Jews that he will be honored by the Gentiles. Thank goodness, because 
We are Gentiles, most of us. And he ends with this list, last little phrase, for I'm a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name shall, is to be feared amongst the nations. Feared as in respected, honored. In chapter 2, God shifted his focus to a corrupt priesthood who had become complacent in their sacred duties. And their special covenant relationship God established with the Levite tribe, descendants of Levi. And he tells them, you know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord. The key element is that God will always keep his promises and his covenants. He doesn't change, never has, never will, cannot, will not. But those who in Levi, he will judge because of their profaning the office of priesthood. For the priest should uh, keep knowledge and the people should seek it from their mouth. But you have departed, says the Lord. In other words, the priests were not representing God to the people and they were ignoring the law. One of which, allowing the people to bring improper sacrifices. Matter of fact, there's a requirement for the priest to examine whatever sacrifice is brought in and they weren't doing it. And then the last, he chastises the tribe of Judah, or the Jews, for there was an abomination committed in Israel and Jerusalem, because they're forsaking the wives of their youth and marrying foreign wives instead. Wives that were serving a different God. And go over and over again in Scripture, God has warned against, it's not the inner marriage, it's bringing the false God into it. For instance, there was a number of people who became wives of faithful Jews. Why? Because they, and the best example I can think of offhand, is Ruth. She was a Moabitess, but she was a believer in God. She served God, worshipped God, and she became the great-grandmother, I believe it was great-grandmother, of King David. So it isn't the the foreignness, it's the bring, not believing in God and bringing foreign idol worship into the, the tribes. And as we begin this study in chapter 3, we'll see a shift. Chapter 3 is really messianic prophecies, as we'll see. Verse 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way for me. And the Lord you, whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Notice carefully, these, this verse uh, speaks of two messengers. The first, undeniably, is uh, John the Baptist when it says, he will prepare the way for me, my messenger. And in those days, in, in uh, the Middle East, it was common for kings, when they were going somewhere, sending messengers out, telling everyone that the king was coming, make his way clear, and prepare for his arrival. Which is exactly what John the Baptist did, preparing the people and their hearts for the arrival of the king, Jesus and his first coming, uh, sometimes referred to as the first advent. The second messenger is Jesus himself. Jesus coming to his temple, fulfilling both the old covenant and his new covenant. Make no mistake, this wasn't the temple rebuilt by Zerubbabel in the time of uh, Prophet Zechariah and Haggai, and it, nor was it the great temple built by Herod the Great. This temple is a temple not built by hands, which tells us exactly this is Jesus' second coming at the end of the age, after the tribulation. 
And if you've been with us with Pastor Steve's study of the Revelation, you will pick up on that. So I highly recommend, if you missed any of it, go back and take a look and listen and read and study on your own. Temple not built by hands. His temple, Jesus' temple. Verse 2 goes on to say, this is why we know this is the end of the end of the age. And who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. You would just recall we talked about the first two chapters of Malachi. The Lord spoke out against corruption of the priesthood. Here, God gives his ultimate answer for that corruption. They will be purged like dross from refining silver, the process of refining silver and gold. And notice, he will sit as a refiner. That can only be the Lord Jesus Christ. He will dip out the, the dross and fire, which when you heat it up hot enough, it comes to the top and you can just scrape it off. That's exactly what will happen. Who can judge but God Almighty? Jesus being God incarnate, when he comes for, this, for these final days, it will be he. And I take it, my personal opinion is that this doesn't just apply to the Levites. It applies to anybody who's professing to preach the word of God and, and bring people to him. That if you're not doing it according to what God says is proper, then you're going to be judged. We're all going to be judged, but if you're saved and a follower of Jesus, you've been forgiven. Your righteousness is in Him. Verse 4. Then, after this happens, the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord. In other words, once the judgment has ended and that Jesus is ruling, everything will be done correctly. There'll be no... And those who come with Jesus when he triumphs the second time, bringing his army on horses, destroying his enemies, establishing his millennial kingdom, will be with him. Those who have gone on before and those who have been called out in the uh, rapture, which we believe the evidence shows that it is before the tri uh, great tribulation. Verse 5, and I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners, widows, and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien, because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. The Bible says that when Jesus returns to establish his millennial reign of a thousand years, he will rule with a rod of iron. Revelation 2.27 says, He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like potter's vessels, as I have received from my Father. The prophecy goes on to say, For I am the Lord. I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed O sons of Jacob. Now note this very carefully. This is God reaffirming his covenant with Abraham and Abraham's descendants. He's never completely destroyed him, nor has he elect, allowed anyone else to do it. Hitler tried to do it. Um, over the years, there's been a great effort, anti-Semitic, to destroy the Jews. This, is a, this was from Satan himself tried to interrupt God's plan of bringing salvation through the descendants. And it's really interesting if you go and watch Pastor 
of Phil's studies in Genesis, you'll see this uh, line that comes all the way through to Jesus and, his, and where he was descended from. Satan has tried to interrupt that, but God doesn't like. Why? Because God is God. He is sovereign, not Satan. Sadly, God's unchanging love for Israel should have made him more obedient and submitted to him. But instead, they presumed on his faithfulness and his patience, his long-suffering, as Scripture says. But there's a time that he says no more. Not gonna, we're gonna, there'll be judgment, and there is judgment coming. Verse 8. Will a man rob God? These rhetorical questions are great. Response, rhetorically, yet you have robbed me. But you say, How, in what way have we robbed you? God says, in tithes and offerings. Verse 9, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now, of course, God doesn't need food, but if you're a student of Scripture, you know that the people of Israel were supposed to bring one-tenth of all their gains, be it animals, grain, wine, grapes, raisins, whatever, into the storehouse. That was a tithe. That was just to sustain the priesthood. They weren't supposed to have jobs. They were not supposed to be farmers or herdsmen. They were supposed to be servants to the people representing God to them and what God desired and following the laws of Moses. But they weren't. People weren't doing their tithes. It's also interesting to note that the tithe was also used to sustain the poor. And once every three years, it was put aside solely for that purpose. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 28 through 29. And now, this is a beautiful verse, and you probably heard it, but I, I can't help but uh, feel chills when I read it. And after he says this about the ties into his house, he says, the Lord says, Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open to you, for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing, there'll be not enough room to receive it. Wow. There's a short little thing I want to say from my personal experience. In 2005, I was on my very first uh, mission trip. It was for Katrina relief in Biloxi, and we worked hard every day. But there was so much joy in being there and doing what we were doing. I told a pastor that was with us that I felt guilty because it seemed like I was being blessed far more than the effort I put in. He looked me in the eye, and I'll never forget this, and he said, you cannot outgive God. And that's what he just said. I will pour out for you such a blessing that will not be room enough to receive it. You simply can't outgive the Lord. His store, his provision is limitless. His power is without equal. Such a profound truth. I like to say, I think of it like this, that's God's economy. You follow Him, you obey Him, pray and study and all those things, not just with tithes and offerings, but with everything we give to God, our service, our devotion, our praises, our thanksgiving, acts of kindness, love, service, are all given, if we give it to God, because we love God, our God, love our Lord Jesus. He will bless us in ways we will not fully grasp. Now, we may not see it here in this life, but it will add up. As Jesus said, 
store up things that are going to be in heaven, not here on earth where rust, moth and rust does corrupt. You read it again in here. Verse 11, And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Now these are all future prophet prophecies and periods of time in the history of Israel that did have these kind of prosperities. And people did come to look upon Israel as, as blessed. And they should, because they are. And we should bless them. But the people complain. Verse 13, Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, What have we spoken against you? You have said, the Lord speaking, It is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, that we have walked as mourners? That really means humbly before the Lord of hosts. So now we call the proud blessed, and for those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. This harsh indictment by the Lord says he's, the people are seeing the proud and the prosperity of the, of the wicked, and they felt it was useless to serve God. But there's a reckoning coming, folks. God is not going to be mocked. Sure, they may seem like they're doing well, but you think about it. Of all the rich people that are in this world and all the people who are famous, what happens to them? If they're not grounded in the Lord Jesus, they go astray and stay and do wicked things and sometimes commit heinous crimes, kill themselves, get on drugs, you name it, it happens. Do not judge people but whether they are following God or not by their outside appearances. What's in their heart? What, does they, what do they do? How do they serve? But the next thing is said, as for this rebuke, listen to what God says. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him. For those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Don't, don't miss this. Verse 17. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. On that day I will make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man who spares his own son who serves him. Think about the magnitude of all that. To fear the Lord and to speak with one another about it, our love, our worship. That's why it's so important to be in a fellowship with believers, to have these discussions. God hears it and has it written down in a book of remembrance, not because he can't remember it. I personally believe this will be read aloud in heaven for those who go there. Further, God says these people that do this are to be his jewels, now, jewels of the king of the universe. And he spares us because he sees us who are redeemed in Christ as sons and daughters. Verse 18. Then you shall again discern between righteousness and wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. In serving and studying God's Word, we gain discernment. In God's view of what is righteous and what is, is neither ambiguous nor is it hidden. It's plain. It's out there. There is, can't be any mistake. You can't really, unless you try and don't want to follow it, you cannot really deny what he says. That's why it's important to teach the entire Scripture important to study all of it. It's all worthwhile. 
It's all for us. It's all interwoven together in one love story. And what God says is righteous and what he declares as wicked has not, will not, and cannot change. No matter what society says, you go to God's word, you're never wrong. And as believers in God's son, Jesus, let your joy as being a child of the king and knowing you are saved just radiate. Be the light. We're forgiven of our sins and washed in the blood of Jesus. We are blameless. We follow him. We declare our love for Jesus. We're blameless in the eyes of God solely because of him. We're refined like pure gold and silver. We're a jewel in God's eyes. A beacon of hope to a lost world. Stand firm in his word. Do not give in to the lies and corruption that are rampant everywhere. Society doesn't make the rules God does. The Lord God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As so are his promises. They stand. Blessed be his name. If you've not accepted Jesus as your Savior, I encourage you to do so now. Establish a guarantee of his grace and gift of eternal life. It's right there for asking. The only way we can be cleansed and made righteous in the sight of God is through faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work upon the cross. There simply is no other way. It's a lie from the pit of hell that they're all roads lead to heaven. It's a lie. In the Last Supper, Jesus said to his disciples in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, and I want to read this because I think it's so important. He had been telling his disciples of his, he was going to be, he t told he was going to die. They did not understand, and he's telling them, and I quote, beginning of verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. That's the second coming. And will receive you to myself. And that where I am, you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. The Apostle Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. And how can we know the way? You see, Thomas was pained. You can hear it, you can hear it in the words. He doesn't understand what how he was supposed to to know where Jesus was going and not knowing the way. Is that you? Do you not know the way? Doesn't have to be that way. Jesus said to him, to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's the way to heaven. That's the way to be with Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the light. No other way. God sent his son to pay for our sins without us first becoming righteous because as believers in Christ, God sees us in his righteousness. We're justified as if we never sinned. God cannot look upon sin. As we mature in the faith, and bit by bit, the Holy Spirit will help us become more and more like Jesus. This is the continuing work of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Once you take Jesus in your heart, accept his free gift of grace. And when you do, find yourself a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church with believers. Not perfect ones, we're all sinners, but believers that keep to the Word of God. And if you need prayer, please call on us. 
We have a prayer hotline at 478-227-4708. One of our pastors or senior staff will be blessed and glad to pray with you, to lead you if that's where you wish to go. Once again, a thanks and a shout out to our videographer and brother in Christ, Kyle, as he puts these ministries on Calvary Chapel Heartland and YouTube channel and Facebook site. Join us next week as we close out this wonderful book of prophecy with Malachi chapter 4 and close out this study. May God richly bless you and keep you and your family. Amen.